All right, welcome, welcome, everybody. Uh, we are going to be doing a little podcast for you. This is going to be your your week eight companion, if you will. Um, this is going to help you kind of parse through the stuff that you're reading in the textbook and, and maybe get some of my perspective on it. Um, of course, I'm Kevin. You know me. And this is... Thomas. Yeah, this is Thomas. He's a, he's a fellow young economist, just like me. So we hopefully will be able to give you guys some... Uh, some good insight on the kind of stuff that you're studying in your in your textbook, and uh, we'll expand on this material. So, chapter twelve of Mankiw's Principles of Macroeconomics. What a wild ride it is, you know. But it starts it starts with a discussion of uh, how countries perform economically, and how some countries are rich and some countries are poor. We've talked about this in class before. We've talked about how we can maybe measure it with GDP, um, but what we're trying to get at with this chapter is why. Why are some countries poor? Why are some countries not so poor? So yeah. And I mean, this is like the question of macro. Yes. Right? So this is like the main, this is the question that nobody has really, I mean, it's not answered. It's almost unanswerable, really. Right. It's not like you can do a statistical study and then say, well, this percent of this economy's success is because they had human rights. And this percent is because they had oil under their country. Um, Economists, this is is the big question, like you're saying. How do we promote growth? How do we make our technology get better? How do we make our lives longer, our people healthier, our people smarter? All these things kind of roll into... This, this chapter and this question of, of productivity and growth. Right. And so there are many, I mean, we were talking about this a little bit before, but um, I think it's interesting that the first thing this book brings up is productivity. Um, and, I mean, as you're getting into it, I think, I mean, the first, I mean, there are three kind of keys, physical, um, human, and technological capital. Yeah, So for sure. So, like, I mean, physical capital is going to be like your, you know, what, what machines you have, what, what tools you have to get, get these jobs done to produce economically, you know. Um, human capital, obviously, more along the lines of, you know, how educated your workforce is, um, whether they work well together, whether they are forcibly isolated at home, <laughs> maybe, maybe. Yeah, we need um, to get apart a little bit. <laughs> yeah, we probably should. We're not practicing good social distancing. I'm risking it for you guys. That's you're welcome. I don't even know you. So. <laughs> um, technological growth or technical technology generally, really, like obviously, a country that has cars can move goods across its country and be more productive than a country that doesn't have cars right. or the internet. And or, this is why we see like certain countries focus in on certain products because you're clearly going to choose to produce those products, which fall most closely into the kind of capital that you have, um, which is interesting when you think of what countries kind of do what. Like if you think of maybe like Southeast Asia, you think maybe more of a like human capital and maybe like technology. Um, but if you think of like maybe Saudi Arabia, then you think a lot of that physical or the, it did mention, I'm kind of lumping Those in like physical natural and natural resource, resource right? Yeah. Um, you think more of like a natural resource kind of, um, really heavy emphasis within their economy. And I mean, that's almost their entire, like, a lot of their wealth is generated that way. Um, so it's interesting to see, like, an interesting perspective to view countries because it gives you good insight into, um, as you see what's coming out of the country, you can kind of see, oh, okay, well, that's where they're getting their productivity from. Yeah, absolutely. Um, but, you know, productivity isn't the whole story, I would say. Um, the reasons countries grow, the reasons countries are productive, I think in a lot of ways is directly linked to like the social and political institutions that they have. And maybe this is my political science background creeping out, but I really believe that a country that values you know, property rights, um, keeping taxes at least reasonably low to kind of uh, push forward your economy and let your businesses kind of kind of do their right. thing. The legal are, system. Yeah, the legal I'd system. I'd say the legal system, um, it does go in with the property rights, but just a strong legal system in general without that, that to me is like the foundation. Um, and knowing that laws are going to be applied 
um, consistently. And, I mean, if corruption, we can see time and time and time again, no matter what kind of country you try to set up, if it's known to be corrupt, I mean, how can you get people to come in and invest if you think that in two years your, your oil company that you invested in this country is just going to be um, nationalized? They're just they're not going to do it. And so you have to have some structure. And, I mean, that also takes some, uh, I mean, there's always trust there because I'm, it's not unimaginable to think that America could nationalize like some country that came and invested here, or some country, some a company from another country that invested here, but that is pretty far-fetched. Um, not so much in, say, like Venezuela, I would, for example. I would definitely but, agree. I think you hit on something that is absolutely crucial to a, a properly functioning economy, and that is trust. Not just trust, like you were talking about, between corporations and the government, but trust between people and the government. People and people, I think, is huge. If you you got to be able to trust the person next to you, and you got to be able to trust the corporations to some extent. Like, I mean, I hate to bring up the the elephant in the room, but like the whole reason we're on this podcast is, you know, there's you know maybe a bug going around or something. You know, uh, you got to be able to trust a company like Kroger or Walmart or whatever to get you resources, to get you the things that you need to live in a, in a situation like this. And that's a lot of trust. A lot of trust I don't think we, maybe we don't have, maybe we do. I think we're kind of seeing that maybe we do have it. And maybe that's, maybe that relationship between corporations and people uh, matters and is like a useful, productive relationship to have in your society. Well, it definitely matters. Um, I mean, it plays into so much, I mean, it plays into a lot of our decisions, right? Um, but it is a lot easier to trust like a local grocery store that you know the owner versus um, you're going to Sam's or um, like a local pharmacy versus some massive pharma company. It's always easy to kind of, uh, I mean, distrust because we hear so many stories and um, you have example after example of, after example of like exploitation by large companies, but it really is crucial to, like, I mean, the entire, like, I mean, fabric of society, because at some point, I mean, you never know what's going to happen, but, like, I mean, we're clearly in, clearly in a situation now where we need companies to say, instead of making these clothes that we usually make, we're going to make um, clothes for, like, medical professionals, or instead of making some kind of, um, like, I don't know, something that some mask <laughs> could be transitioned <laughs> into, they now start making masks. You guys know what I mean. But that is really important, and it may, hopefully it will like install some more faith in companies that, I mean, they're going to generally do the right thing. I would say that's also due to markets, though. I mean, obviously there's pretty big incentives to like transition now, but it's also just because, I mean, it's what we need. So That reminds me of, uh, I saw an article about an Irish company last week that, uh, it had been distilling liquor, but started distilling hand sanitizer. Yeah, I think Anheuser Busch started doing that. There's, I've heard that from multiple, like even from local breweries. Like some of my friends out in Colorado were telling me about that. To so like bigger companies as well. So apparently that's pretty that's common. Well. Then I mean, I think I've heard that those two um, like processes are somewhat similar. I mean, it's awesome to see for sure. Um, but I think getting into the the next as far as like really core um, institutions within countries. Um, one of the first things that I always think is is the history and what you social capital. Yeah, social capital, social right. infrastructure, whatever you want right. to call it. But yeah, like the history of the country. So, you know, if if your country historically was a country where people were like oppressed and kind of I think a good word for it is extractionary. Extraction what? states. Right. Extraction states, yeah. So if, if you, you know, you can think of like uh, the South in the mid-1800s perhaps, or even more so like the Caribbean in the 16 and yeah. 1700s. Caribbean, uh, I mean, all over Africa. Yeah, I mean, I mean, for sure. Yeah, I mean, those are definitely the first that my mind go to. The but Belgian the Caribbean, Congo, oh my yeah, goodness. Yeah, of course. <laughs> Of course. And I mean, there's many, many reasons now for like the conflicts and things that we see there. But I think the Caribbean is a really good example as well um, because it's not quite as extreme, maybe, as like the African example. But we can still see that p 
people within those countries, I mean, it's, it's really difficult, it seems, to transition from where all of your resources are constantly being taken out um, into a society that does have property rights, that um, does have a strong social or um, strong, like, law. Um, and trust. And trust. Right? right. Trust. Trust is something, and, you know, maybe I'm carrying a little too much political theory over, but trust is something that can determine what your society looks like. And it's something that's built, believe it or not, over generations, you know? Trust in government isn't something, like, you just wake up and have. Like, someone doesn't immigrate from a country where the government stole from them constantly, come here, and they're just like, oh, yeah, I can trust this government. It's got my back. You don't have that trust. You're from a culture where there, the, you have no reason to have that trust. That actually reminds me of a friend of mine named Franklin. And Franklin, uh, he was from Nigeria. And he actually grew up in the capital of Nigeria. Uh, Lagos is the name of that city. But Franklin told me about how the whole time you know, he lived in Nigeria, he never had a positive relationship with the, with the police. Um, because not only, I mean, obviously we have our problems with police here, but it's, uh, you know, they come after you with the intent of stealing from you with the intent of, you know, like, Oh, I don't think this building's safe enough. Like you, you gotta pay us a fine like right now, or we might have to burn it down. I think we, yeah, I think (laughs) that's like, that's not the kind of situation where you want to be. Yeah. Or if you, Oh, if you want to go from this province in our country to this province next door you got to pass this little border that border's got a checkpoint and there's cops on it to take a bribe right. you can't you can't build a functioning economy in a country like that and i think we take for granted that that doesn't happen in <clears throat> i mean i don't want to say more than it doesn't happen but that happens in many many countries throughout the world and i'm definitely not saying i'm sure it definitely like happens, happens here. It definitely sure. happens in America, but, it's, but the prevalence of it is not something that, like, I, I mean, I, I would certainly say in general, rare. people don't drive down the road and think, like, oh, like, I hope I don't hit this toll booth and, like, a cop stand there and be like, oh, well, you owe me $500 if you're going to get into whatever state that you're going into, you know? I don't think that's super common. That is true, um, but I do drive my car thinking, oh, God, I hope I don't get pulled over. I hope yeah. I don't get a speeding ticket. I, and... You know, That's it's true. it's uh, yeah. We can we can debate on uh, you know maybe some libertarian principles on whether or not taxation is is theft or not. I, I would probably think no. I know some some peers of mine maybe would disagree <laughs> with that, but uh, well, I mean, we can definitely debate on it. But we can definitely agree. The, theft is yeah, theft. Theft is definitely theft. Yes, um, and you can't really have good productivity. You can't have good economic growth in a like a country where people constantly steal from each other. Right. And that's a real problem, like in, in places in the world today. Yes. And that that's really why there are some countries that don't grow. Yeah. I and, think, exa- and that gets right into this next point of, like, especially the diminishing returns, is we don't see countries who should be growing at, at higher rates. There's, so, I mean, it's such a complex issue. There's so many, th- I mean, the dynamics within every country. I mean... Um, take like countries like Chad have like a hundred different groups of people who speak different languages in such a small area and they don't really have I mean they don't have a language really that unifies them that they, they would say right um, from from everything I know clearly I'm not from Chad but just from my reading I can only imagine how like that affects like the productivity of those people it, it can't I can't imagine that 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 helps it. It definitely you know? doesn't, especially right. not if you're taking kind of like a country level perspective. Right, yeah. right, right, right. Um, but I, I want to flesh out what you were what you were saying here. You said that some countries we would expect to grow faster, and what right. you, what he's talking about there in the text is called the catch up effect. And basically, the idea behind that is that the countries like America have been making machines and making tools, uh, capital, if you will to make themselves more productive for hundreds of years. That's not the case in every country. Some countries don't have that, that history of manufacturing and, and uh, you know, different capitals, you know, even human capital. Other countries don't have this history 
that we do and other developed countries do. And it's beneficial to us because we're rich right now. But the, the, the trade-off is that we're not going to grow as fast, right? You can think, you know, uh, what's the effect of, of one new robot at the plant down here the road, at the Corvette factory? You know, that one more robot isn't going to vastly change how many Corvettes they can make. But one robot can vastly, vastly change the productivity in a country that has none, you know? Um, so that's the idea of, of diminishing returns. As you, you know, when you don't have anything, you know, adding that first unit of, of capital is really important. But when you already have a bunch of capital, adding more doesn't do a ton for you. You could think about it like this. You know, if I'm running a company and all we do is we take papers that people already have and staple them, and I have four employees and one stapler, buying another stapler is really, really helpful. Right. And it keeps being really helpful until the fifth stapler, and then I don't really have a reason to buy another one. And that's not going to have the same benefit to my company. Yeah. And you can only imagine the effects of how, of like, I mean, your incentives of what you're doing is if you thought that somebody could come in at any time and steal two of your staplers. Right. Absolutely. Think, think about how that would affect your, your actions. I mean, everything you do would be, I mean, in the back of your mind, you'd have, it'd be a pretty calculated, I mean, a pretty big risk, you know, especially if that stapler is a $500,000 machine. Right. And, and who, right. what kind of company is going to invest, like, millions of dollars in, like, technology, millions of dollars in, in capital in a place where theft is a problem or in a place where, like... You can't trust the government not to nationalize the company right. at any moment. Right. Um, but when I do think catch-up effect, I think the um, – I think did, – did they use these examples in here? I, I imagine they did the South Korean, um, Japan. The, the quote-unquote Asian tigers, I right. think they're referred to as in um, the economic circle. Yeah. I um, assume I saw South Korea in here somewhere. But So was, there definitely is great examples of the catch-up effect happening in the real world. Um, South Korea, Japan, uh, Singapore, Hong Kong, um, even, I don't want to talk too far out of turn, but South Africa, um, even perhaps Egypt, Brazil, there are countries that are able to quickly catch up and take advantage of um, them not having much capital, investing in capital, human capital, technological capital, all these different things, investing in these things and vastly increasing their productivity. I think that that's definitely historically been the case, but there are there are issues with that. That's not a universal rule, you know. If your country has other problems, then you're not going to be able to take advantage of this catch-up effect. Yeah, I mean, exactly. Um, yeah, it's it's. I mean, the interesting thing about macro is that it's so complex, and that like micro, you can. Maybe do an OLS and <laughs> somebody can say, or you can run a regression on something and somebody will be able to say, oh, this caused X, Y, or Z. But like something I always thought was really interesting about macro is that every situation, there's going to be somebody be able to say, well, what about this? You know, because you can't put these things into some like Y equals X plus whatever kind of um definitely hard to jam regression. macroeconomic principles into a formula right because nothing happens in a vacuum in the macro economy right yeah and yeah i mean i'm just reading over over these and this gets kind of back to what i mean we had mentioned this before as well that i mean even these like health and nutrition education um like you can even debate if these are part of what makes the country more wealthy or is it a prescription, like a thing that comes from the country being wealthier? And right. that's even that's even more interesting. And in, in that if you just take education, for example, um, is a country wealthier because the people are more educated, or are those people more educated because they are in a wealthier country, so their government could afford to like build proper schools for the people to have to attend? Um, because I mean. Certainly, a, everywhere, a lot of a, chicken in the egg kind of situation. Right, right, exactly. For sure. Exactly. And, I mean, you could say the same thing about um, pretty many much of these. any of them. Yeah, honestly. exactly. And, I mean, that just kind of comes from, uh, we were talking about this before. I mean, my opinion, and I think people might agree, is that property rights and the political stability um, 
is like a, kind of the found, a big found part of the foundation at least. I mean, you really need those are almost crucial um, to uh, having a wealthy country. So, um, free trade or I think I want to hop over. Um, at the end of the chapter, it talks about population growth, um, and I that you know population growth certainly is going to have a lot to do with with uh, your productivity and with your you know all kinds of different variables in your country. But there are a couple economists that they mention that I find really interesting, and I wanted to talk about them. Um, one of them is Thomas Malthus. Thomas Malthus. He is a crazy old cat from England in the 1700s. Um, one of the earliest uh, economists um, before Adam Smith, the guy that most people consider the father, father of modern economics. Um, and he, he, he takes beef with population growth. He thinks that there are too many people and that these people just having more kids is going to lead to an inevitable catastrophe, right? And that catastrophe is going to be that we're going to run out of food. We, we don't have enough land. Land is fixed, but the people that live on the land is not fixed, right? Um, I think he called it his economic theory of rent. Um, but he's, he's quite a character, and he believes that people are just going to start up and dying. And he misses out on something, though. Because, you know, he's really writing in a, in a pre-industrial revolution society. This is the world of our great 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 grandparents right this is the world of of basically i mean pre-industrial revolution is basically the same world as jesus to some extent right like you you I mean, can you can there's yeah, definitely the, the trends and like i mean a bunch of things have changed but like as far as I like mean, the the broad economic structure of the world hadn't changed people made food the same way they farmed it in a traditional way there were no mechanizations like there was, there was no big leaps from the first agricultural revolution or the the second one where we started farming. Right? It wasn't like large gains in specialization between countries and large trade. Yeah, what, of course. Tr- okay. I mean, there was some. There trade, was some, though. but I mean, not it, like today. Right. Not like today right. at all. But and it was only really happening. I mean, you can correct me if I'm wrong. Mainly, it was like the European countries, where I mean, there was like they were bringing things in from Asia. I'm sure in India, but anyway, um, I mean you're right. So yeah, but go all, ahead with what he's saying. All I was saying, Thomas Malthus thought people were gonna die because he lived in a world that didn't have growth. Yeah, I mean a time before fast yeah, I, economic growth. I thought his quote was interesting. Food is necessary for the existence of man, and the passion between the sexes is necessary. It will remain nearly in its present state. So he concluded the power of the population is indefinitely greater than the power in the earth to produce subsistence for man. So he thought and people I think were just going to be like rabbits, pretty much. Right. And just overtake whatever they're... <laughs> that, that's definitely what he thought. I mean... It's, it's quite a... It is it's funny. A it's kind of funny now. Of it's funny now, but... <laughs> <laughs> it's funny now to, to think that somebody would think that, but like... I definitely shouldn't laugh because if you had told me that and when I lived in, like, I, I mean, you don't have, what are you going to say? Like, oh, dude, it like, like you've never seen a tractor. Yeah. Like the only way you make food is taking a plow and a donkey and like <laughs> making it happen. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. He's like, like dude, in like a hundred feet, like when was he alive? 1800, 200 years. We're going to have like Walmart. And yeah. He so. definitely didn't know that. And I, I think that another economist that the book talks about kind of is, you know, the other side of the coin. Yeah. Uh, Michael Kramer, a much more recent economist, he wrote a pretty influential paper that argued that having big population centers, having people together, is crucial to this fast technological growth. And I would argue that that is what we see historically, and, and he, he definitely... I wouldn't say, you know, it's kind of hard to prove things in economics, but as much as you can, he definitely made a great argument for why, like, technological growth is, is inexorably tied to your population size and your population growth. Um, having people together, people are able to specialize. So instead of having one guy that does leather stuff, we have one shoe guy and one, you know, yeah. whatever, uh, saddle 
maker and, right. and once people can specialize then we eventually specialize to have like scientists and we specialize to have research and development people and do you, do you think that's um do you think it's because oh yeah yeah go ahead go ahead sorry but uh, yeah that's basically all i'm driving at is that population is directly linked to technological oh, okay growth. what i was gonna ask sorry do you think that there's it's part of it is because there's larger incentives for people as there's so if you're just thinking like monetarily if you have a like a village of 10 people and you make some big innovation then like the other nine people are gonna like pay you whatever it is to be able to get that but if you're in like say new york city and you make a really big innovation or you're in like somewhere clearly today it isn't really like that but like back then let's say you're in like london then you have like a way bigger incentive to like innovate because there's just so much more demand a huge market you know right yeah so it it might just be because i mean yeah as there's like more people you can maybe it's just clear what the market what the market wants maybe i mean that's with his theory i wouldn't say that's like in contrast to what he's saying at it's all. definitely not it's just like more it. of a like what could the What's the reasons for it? You know? Yeah, Tommy's right. take on Michael yeah. Kramer. I mean, I, I'm just asking. I don't know. I don't know. But yeah, just just wondering. Well, so cool, cool. Uh, I think we've pretty much gone through the chapter. That's chapter twelve, you guys. Um, I'll probably keep putting these up if you guys like them. Um, just you know, let me know. Give me some feedback if you found this useful. Um, you know, like, comment, subscribe. All the, all the, all the. <laughs> That's the first thing that came to my mind. But I was like, don't say it. <laughs> don't oh, say come it. On. Oh, you gotta say it. Uh, right. No, I hope you guys enjoy it, though. Yeah, and, for sure. Yep, thanks. Um, so, to underscore, big point. Some countries are rich. Some countries are poor. We can't pinpoint this is why, but if we were going to pinpoint, we would say productivity matters a lot, and institutions, social institutions, political institutions, they matter a lot also. That's it. Thank you, guys.